This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Joining us today for a cup of coffee to talk about Battle Scars, the seventh episode in Star Wars, The Bad Batch's first incredible season. First, we're going to bring in Tom Gross. Hello, everybody. Oh, boy, this Bad Batch uh, season just whew, just keeps getting better. You look more and more to the next Friday, each episode that gets released. It's very true. Speaking of looking forward to, somehow it, yes. it was brought to my attention that there was a great injustice in the galaxy. Alan Zog, our other guest co-host, has never been on Coffee with Kenobi, so we got to bring him in properly. Welcome to the show, Alan Zog. Hey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, <laughs> thanks, guys. I, I really appreciate it. I'm I'm excited. Like, I, I'm really excited, thrilled to talk with you guys. And it was cool having having you guys and Corey on when we did Idiot's Array last week, too. It's really awesome. Yeah, we, we had a great time. You mentioned Idiot's Array. Mm-hmm. That is the podcast that Alan is one of the co-hosts of. It's a great show. Yes, Tom, Corey, and I were just on. We did a tournament where we talked about, basically, we we chose some of the best droids in the Star Wars universe. We had a great time doing that. Let's go ahead. Speaking of great times, let's jump right into this episode. Alan, we'll start with you. Go ahead and give us a, a letter grade and your overall thoughts on the episode. Letter grade. Wow. Put me on the spot here. I hadn't even mm-hmm. thought about that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will say, it, first of all, I say it's probably not the best episode of the season so far, but if I were to give it a letter grade, I'd probably say a solid B. Well, okay. I look forward to, can you give us sort of a, a super quick synopsis of why you feel that way? So, I, I, there, there's a lot that goes into what I enjoy about these, but briefly, I, I like when they in, in, introduce new characters. I like when there's um, w- when they kind of delve into a little bit of the, the lore, and I, and I realize that's hard with, with clones, but they do. And so this episode seemed to me like more than anything, it wasn't filler. It wasn't any of that stuff. It was, it was really hitting hard on some things that we've known since, since Clone Wars Season 6, I guess it is, The Lost Missions. So... Mm-hmm. And, and and I almost felt like this was coming too, because this there was this was a setup for about two episodes leading into this one. So to me, it was a, it was a solid show, a solid episode, not the best of the season, but definitely a solid. That's why I feel like it's a B. All right, very good, uh, Tom. What about you? Well, great points, Alan. And I have to say, this episode is exactly what I was waiting for. I give it an A plus. Um, there were some wonderful, wonderful moments. Um, there were some beautiful, uh, beautiful images that I've been, I don't know. It's not that I've been looking forward to a scrapyard of Republic ships or just, uh, starships in general, as Hunter said. Um, but I thought the visuals were wonderful in this The Um, and I'll bring up some of them as we go through, uh, and then, there were some there were some really good moments where the uh, the music in the background I felt uh, brought tension into the story. So I think like all pieces of storytelling uh, in Bad Batch style, Star Wars, Lucasfilm style, I thought a lot of that came together in this one. We get a resolution on one of the items that was keeping us ten- tense and. Uh, uh, you know, and here we take care of that in episode seven. I don't know. I just thought there was a lot of stuff that came together in this for me personally that I've been waiting for that I, I, ha- I have to give it an A+. Plus. I'm also going to give it an A+. Plus. That's two weeks in a row of an A+, plus, which is uh, it's nice. Yeah. It's nice to be able to say that. But for me, uh, I, I really enjoyed the fever pitch, the tension, which only can happen if you don't have six episodes before that give you that solid payoff, that that emotional punch. Uh, and you don't really know where it's going to go direction wise, as far as the show, because we, again, I've been saying this since the show started, but we don't know what's going to happen with the bad batch characters. We don't have that story canonical safety net. So to see things play out the way that they did and how they were resolved, I thought was wonderful. So let's go ahead and start off the show Tom, We've got a chase sequence right away. I don't know about you, but the whole spirit of the entire thing very much gave me a vibe of Star Wars Rebels, even to the to the starships themselves. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I th- I thought the the opening with um you know we don't know where they've been what they're doing we get a hint when there's a little creature in a cage which seems to be Sid's sort of go to. I mean here in, in the last episode there or in a, in a previous episode they were going after the um, the rancor and here is a little creature which we don't know why. They have it, and quite frankly, neither does Sid. We learn, but uh, but yeah, a great a, a great sequence with um, uh, the chase, and, uh, and of course, you know, some laughs with Wrecker in in the midst of the attention, where he's afraid of this little uh, creature that's crawling up him. Uh, sense a little bit of competition or frustration between Tech and uh, Echo. Well, when Echo gets things going, I'm working on it. You know, all that kind of stuff. A lot of fun. Uh, great way to start a, an episode. So it certainly seems like Sid through the last couple episodes is, is accumulating like a zoo or something. I'm not really sure. But Alan, we do get some small character stuff here. We get, of course, the the continual foreshadowing of Wrecker and the headaches. But what do you, what do you make of the, the situation with how the characters are interacting? And is it, do we learn much about them in this or is it just pretty much just set up? Um, I don't know. I feel like... It, it, like like you mentioned, the whole zoo thing with, with Sid, I, I feel like that we're not getting much set up with that anymore. Um, I, I feel like, if anything, it's just it, there's no setup required in this. In fact, I was going to say the setup to me feels like the headaches that Wrecker's been getting kind of sets this whole episode up. And it's not just that he has him in here. He had him in, what was it, the last episode, I think, was when he started to experience him or the episode before him, if I'm remembering right. But... The, the headaches kind of set him up and lead up to this. So I, as far as interactions go, I think I'm enjoying Wrecker and, and Omega right now and the, the relationship that they've been growing. And really there's quite a bit of that in the first part of this episode. There is. And, and I think it's, it's nice to see because we know when, because they were extra sweet to each other, I thought to myself, okay, this is bad. They're setting it up. <laughs> so it'll be, it will sting even more at the end, but eventually they, they blast in the hyperspace, which I, I kind of scratched my head and I said to my son, so Wrecker and Omega didn't have seatbelts on. They just went into hyperspace. So there's no, I mean, if that doesn't activate a headache, I don't know what's going to, right. but I guess it, I guess it doesn't matter that much. Um, we, we get back to or, or Mantel. And I thought there was an interesting conversation, Tom, between Sid and I believe in Hunter where, you know, basically Hunter's like, well, yeah, as long as you get paid, you don't really seem to mind. Do you, the ethics yeah. slowly continue to creep in. And I'm not really sure if Sid is going to continue to be this way or not. I mean, she is uh, she does deal with members of the underworld all the time and deals in some shady business. But it's you can tell it's starting to bother Hunter even more, I think. Oh, yes, I completely agree. Um, you know, we, we have been talking about this for a while and debating, you know, where she stands in sort of the the morality of the of the galaxy. And, you know, when, when he, when she says, well, it's time to get paid and she walks over and she hands it to him and he says, either he Hunter or um, uh, Echo says, this isn't what you said. You're, this is a, there, you know, you were going to give me us more. And she says, no, I'm going to make that more. And, uh, and starts, you know, and she throws the question back onto them as what would you be doing without me essentially? And so I don't know. Even to the point of saying that she keeps them alive. Yes. Yeah. And I just, I don't know. I was, I was really enjoying her and just found her to be a uh, comic relief to a point, but that scene, I just, I didn't feel good about like her intentions almost to the point where it's like they're irritated with her and she's as irritated with them that they continue to complain about, you know, the pay or they seem un- to her, they seem ungrateful for, you know, the jobs and the uh, services. So I think we were, everyone uh, was lucky for the, um, the interruption that, uh, that happened. They, I think so. And then we get um, things that do make us happy because I agree. Sid is becoming uh, a little, a little more, a little more unsavory to me. So I don't I know. Well, it'd be interesting. Go I didn't ahead. even find I didn't even found find it amusing when she called him when she called Tech Goggles again. Like this no, time it, it didn't we've it didn't heard ha- that. It, Yeah, it didn't have the same it was it was almost more like condescending. You know, the first yes. time it was just a way to label him. Here it felt like more condescending. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I and I don't sense we're gonna see her next episode, but I it 
it's inter- the next the next time they meet with her uh, will definitely be sort of telling us to where this this relationship is going. No, I, I agree. Uh, speaking of where the relationship is going, um, we find out, Alan, that Omega and Wrecker have a tradition. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Let's talk about that tradition and sort of how we learn about it as an audience. Oh, I don't even know what to call what they're eating at this point. But that tradition. They call it. They call after. it mantel mix. Mantel mix. <laughs> it's almost like so I, yeah, all I can think of is Chex mix. You know, they're having their Chex mix afterwards, but you know, getting together and eating it. What is it after every adventure they have or something to reward themselves with? Um, I kind of like the banter that's been going back and forth between the two of them. Um, and as much as there's a distasteful feeling with Sid that, that, that the two of the, the, the t- I can't talk today, but these two bring a lot of kind of colorful, uh, fun, I guess you should say between the two of them in this episode. And, and I kind of enjoyed the relationship they're having with each other. Yeah. It's very charming. It's so much so that, when record basically asked for permission, like he's a kid and hunters, the dad, I thought that was funny. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, records like, well, it makes the kid happy. And, and Hunter sort of air quotes is, Oh yes, it makes the kid happy. The reason this is spectacular. <laughs> there's a lot of reasons this is spectacular, but this man tell mix to me looks exactly like the popcorn or the caramel corn. You can get it at Katsaka's kettle at galaxy's edge. It's the, some of the best popcorn I've ever had. Oh. The fact that they're actually eating it yeah, on, in the episode, and it sure looks the same. By the way, there's a spicy kind and a sweet kind. You have to eat them at the same time. That's the best way to taste it on Galaxy's Edge. That's your Galaxy's Edge tip for the day, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. But the fact that they're bringing it into it like that was just wonderful to me, as was the reveal uh, that Sid has some pretty significant debt that they owe her, and which Hunter was not aware of. But then record Tom shows us just exactly why the debt's as high as it actually is. <laughs> yeah, when they take the uh, Mantel mix, the um, um, oh, it, shoot, I, I forget the the name of the race that that is selling it. Um, oh, Pantorans. The Pantoran uh, says uh, you pay for that, and record goes, oh, uh, put it on Sib's tab. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sid's not having any of that, and she's adding it to uh, Hunter's tab, and uh, and so yeah, they they do seem to be having a bit of a um, uh, a debt rising. But some of those things, I guess, I would have assumed, and I'm assuming that Hunter also assumed, you know, docking fees, stuff like that. You know, she they're doing these chores i guess you could say for her so you'd think some of these would be covered but sid's a businesswoman and uh and she's this is how she makes money exactly and it's uh i think it's kind of it reminded me of the movie fletch the whole chevy chase movie with the underhill (laughs) different people will will get that joke uh but but the jokes are over because we go back inside the uh, sid's place and there's a shadowy figure at the bar, Alan. Go ahead and talk to us about the reveal of who that character is and how it felt for you to see this character return. So I have to, I have to prequis, prequis, yeah, talk about that ahead of time of how I felt when they even showed there's a shadowy character. I started to think bad things, but I yeah. thought maybe that this was their pursuer or this was the, you know, the bounty hunter yep. who's after them. Yep. Um, but when they finally do reveal him, I thought, when I saw his eyes, it was even before he took his hood off. It was his eyes. I was like, "Oh, this can't be." I thought for sure right away it was Rex, and I was really happy to have to realize that it was. Um, I I figured we were going to see him at some point in time in the series. It had to happen, and there was no a better episode than the current one for him to to appear in. I almost wonder if we're going to see Ahsoka at some point in time, but that's speculating. But I really liked this reveal. I was excited to see him. Um, and also to have him realize that, oh, wait, you still have your chip in. Um, that's not good, you know, to, to see the way he interacted with them and, and not just the clone camaraderie, but with the fact that he recognizes things in the clones. And then, of course, you know, and maybe you'll get into this, but the way Omega re- recognized what generation clone he was for that yeah. matter. Yes, because that the lines in his face. Yeah, that thought that was pretty brilliant. I, I love I I love this uh, part 
because there's so many things that Al, that Alan you just said that that were was portrayed so well. The camaraderie of clones. I mean, where else do you have more camaraderie than sitting at a tavern at a bar visiting? And that's where they end up, and that's kind of where that scene happens. But then, oh my gosh, how tense was that when when Rex brings his hand back onto his pistol when he discovers that those chips are in. Oh my gosh, that was so chilling. And in in that same shot is Omega in sort of the, you know, down at that level as well. That just was, you know, a child, a child witnessing this um, just seemed kind of just all frightening at once. And I love that when we first realize there's someone in that area, the way that the the figure is carrying themselves, and of course it is Rex, as we've said, the way that he's carrying himself and the way that his posture is, I thought for a hot minute that would be Obi-Wan Kenobi. I couldn't figure out story-wise how that would make sense. And obviously it's not Obi-Wan oh. Kenobi. <laughs> but you can tell that he's been around Jedi, right? They're, they're, I mean, yeah. he's, a, he's, a, he's a top-tier soldier, clearly. But the poise, the gravitas was all there. But then the, the way it was dramatically revealed, I thought was wonderful. And then, Tom, we have when... When Racker realizes who it is, did you did you catch when he picks up up Rex to give him a hug? How Rex gets out of the hug? Did you catch that? I didn't. What what does he do? <laughs> I, I noticed he gives him a either. little push, but did did you see it, Alan? No. <laughs> yeah, and it, it it's basically it is basically just a a, a push, but it, it also was like a push of disgust. And I and I was trying to kind of figure out what what that might mean. I mean, I mean, Rex doesn't have a reason to be warm and fuzzy right now because of all the things that are going on. We find out that Trace and Rafa told him about the Bad Batch, so maybe that too was uh, at the end of the episode in the hologram. I mean, it it stands the reason at least they want us to think that right now. They've but, all met. Yeah, they've all met for sure. Yeah, yeah. But but then we get and you alluded to this already, Alan. Rex has. Um, a very visceral reaction to Wrecker's headache, which I thought was extraordinarily powerful, particularly him fully explaining how dangerous they all are. Alan, what did you think about Rex's explanation? I also tell me about a text evaluation of the situation too. Well, the, what came to mind was immediately Rex's experience with order 66 itself just how tense it was, how much it took him to resist and then finally not be able to, and for Ahsoka to, to, to basically have to, to, to literally force him in order to get the chip out. So, of course, with his experience, he knew right away just how dangerous it was. And so when he's discovering that, the moment becomes tense. That's all I can think about is his moments on the cruiser with Ahsoka and the rest of the clone battalion. So he's been there. He's experienced it. He knows what it can do. He knows you can't control it. And so his concern right away was, okay, we're in a very dicey situation. These guys, any one of these guys can lose it. Yeah, he knows. given moment, and I'm not going to be ready, and nobody's going to be ready for it. No, because uh, he's seen it firsthand. I mean, it's, it's, it was, I mean, it's fair to, experience, to say that he's, probably, he's ex- definitely experienced trauma because of what it, he said, yeah. I don't want to lose anyone, any more of my brothers. But then I'm, he says, clearly says, again, chips make you a threat to everyone, even her. We learn a lot about that there. We learn that Omega does not have an inhibitor chip. And Tom, I don't remember if that ever came up, but I want to ask you, what do you I, were you so surprised that Tech was kind of dismissive of the inhibitor chips and the, the potential for disaster there? Yeah, I did I found that kind of strange because of their loss of crosshair to the chip. Um, but Tech seems perfectly comfortable that the rest of them have it uh, completely under control, which I don't know, I guess it just seems l- to, to tech being very logical that look we made it through order 66 none of us had trouble i mean i guess him in general in specifics but so I, I i had a hard time um coming to terms with that because but that's not the only time in this episode that that tech seemed to go uh, a different direction than i thought he would but um but yeah i thought that was an interesting um stance that he took it, it almost, I, at first I was kind of like, oh, really? Tech wouldn't even consider this? But, I mean, he hasn't yet. In, in a way, Alan, I, I feel like it makes tech more human and relatable because if he's always all about the numbers and, and calculating and, and he's never wrong, then you've got sort of a deus ex mach in a situation where you're, you're there's no peril, there's no risk. But if 
if tech can be wrong about something technologically like that, sure. Then, it, then, it, then if he's more flawed, to me at least, Alan, I, I think that makes tech a little more relatable. I agree, and and I feel like we've really seen this. You know, up up until this point, we've really seen this from tech the entire series, right? For the opening episode, I don't know if you remember when the the idea of Order sixty six came up and that the clones were turning again. You know, Tech was able to run into the you know the database and, and initially you know what it was, but he almost seemed dismissive of it then too, because you know we're 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 exempt, we're the bad batch, nothing like that affects us. And then of course, like Tom mentioned, then you know they lose crosshairs through uh, to it, and yet he still continues to be a, a bit dismissive of it. So y- yeah, I think I think we've seen this from him the entire series, and I think it was finally it, it was very interesting to finally see him get maybe almost a slap in the face, if you will. I don't even want to use that term, but I felt like it for, for once he gets, he gets kind of put back in his place. It's like, no, dude, it's not always like this. Sure. It's, no, it's I know. Not, it's not cut and dry like this. Right. Yeah. It's almost like it was not in his, if it's not in his immediate line of vision, then it's not something that is something that he's concerned with. Let's go ahead and take a quick break. This is coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. With travel beginning to open up and Walt Disney World and Disneyland reaching full capacity, this is the time to book your Disney World vacation with MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. Their signature service and expert advice will help clients maximize their vacation time and dollar. I use Becky Mankin and MEI's incredible services all the time, both for family and for travel for the show because of their no cost, no obligation quote when you use the service. Plus, they proactively adjust the booking if the rate goes down. Literally, I will wake up one morning and I'll get an email from MEI saying that the price went down and I will get a refund sent to my credit card right away. I don't have to do anything. They help your family enjoy everything Galaxy's Edge and the Disney theme parks and the cruise lines have to offer. Can help you plan every detail and always share invaluable tips. That's for Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or other cruise lines. It doesn't have to be Disney-related. They literally can help you plan a vacation anywhere on the planet. Be sure to go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel and sign up for a free no-obligation quote to any of the Disney theme parks on the planet or any vacation that you have in mind. You'll have the best vacation possible and help out me and Coffee with Kenobi in the process. We are back talking Star Wars, the Bad Batch seventh episode, Battle Scars. Sure. So then we realized, so we're, all right, we're going to, we have these coordinates. We're going to meet you. Uh, we go to this starship graveyard where he teams up with Rex. Did, and I didn't realize this initially, but this is the same planet where some of the video game Jedi Fallen Order takes place. In, this, in the starship graveyard at the, at the beginning. Uh, this, the Scrapper Guild controls every, everything on the planet, so they have to be very, very careful. We learn that um, Echo tells Rex that Omega explained the ships to them, so they were very aware of them. But because, again, it wasn't immediately affecting them, they weren't aware. Of course, they didn't know what was happening with Wrecker. But now Rex has made it very, very clear. So we've got this great sequence that really traipses into the realm of horror. But, Tom, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I thought the water, the landscaping, all the colors in this sequence was very haunting and, and extraordinarily beautiful. This is what I was referring to in the opening. Is uh, is really um, Ibraka? Is that the name of the of yes. the uh, planet? Yes. Um, yeah, I thought the the starship graveyard, and yes, I thought the water was magnificent. I wondered when I was watching it. I was like, man, the last time I've seen animated water look this good was in Frozen Two. It just yeah. it, it <laughs> like the the splashes. Yeah. Yeah, the the splashes looked like real droplets of water and and so forth. Dan, I wanted to ask you because you I I never think to turn on the um, subtitles. Is there what's the name of this creature that's in the water? You know, uh, I was just about to talk about that. I thought it looked to me an awful lot like a sarlacc, but it's a Dianoga. Yeah, like, like the no, one in really. Yeah, I know. I yeah. didn't expect that, but that's how it's labeled. Holy smokes! Okay, this I, thing's nasty. Can I interject for a sec? Yeah, please. Yeah, because when, when I was watching that, my first thought immediately went to the garbage compactor. That's immediately yeah. what I thought of. So I, that's when I started looking online. I'm like, what was the name of that creature? And so, yeah, that's where my mind went was right away was to that creature. So I, I thought it was freaking cool. It reminded me of episode 
four all or yeah, episode four all over again. So was there a certain thing? I mean, obviously the tentacles, but was there was there anything else atmospheric or thematically that made you think it was a Dianoga? Well, yeah, the way he dragged the way he dragged Rector down into the water reminded me so vividly of the way mm-hmm. that the the same creature pulled Luke underneath in mm-hmm. in in the garbage can factory scene. Like there were a lot of moments in this scene that vividly called back to that moment in A New Hope. I love it. I, I wrote I wrote that down exactly in my notes. I said the scene is reminiscent of Luke being pulled under on the Death Star. You know, what creature I thought it was. I said this mm. to my daughter when we were watching. I said, I wonder if that's a, what a wrath tar looks under like underwater. That's what Mason said too. Ooh. Mason yeah. thought it was Mason thought it was a wrath tar. Was, I, I thought for weird. sure. But but Dan, I'm with you on the horror uh, feel of this. In fact, I think it. I I think from that moment when Wrecker is creeping across on the rope and it like drops, and then Omega says, "No, nah, you're fine. Just keep." And then of course, you know, it's gonna. You know, it's gonna drop. From that moment and that horrific moment when he's upside down and they see it come under the water, from that point all the way through to almost the resolution of this whole story, I felt like the horror um, environment continued to increase and get darker in flashlights, and, and it just became more and more tense throughout. It reminds me of the first Alien, this, this sequence. Yeah. And then especially the end as well. I, I feel like that we've seen that uh, quite a bit in this season, but it, particularly here in the waterline stuff from is a little bit reminiscent of just the, the feeling of what's underneath is, is more dangerous because you can't see it like the jaws concept. So yeah. there, you've, you've got that. You've got the growing suspense and tension of Wrecker's headaches uh, with Rex very much hammering home what we as an audience have been fearing for a, a few weeks now. You know, he's a ticking time bomb. And the last thing we want is for this guy to turn into Order 66 Trooper when he's got such a good relationship with Omega. Mm-hmm. And then we add to the tension, Alan, by bringing up yet again, not only this the the Dianoga, but Wrecker's fear of heights. I mean, they, yes. they have really gone out of their way to make us feel uh, scared for Wrecker, which I think you have to do because he's such a powerful character. But it's very effective storytelling, I think. Absolutely. And I'm going to add another couple of movies to these scenes that we're going through. You're talking about horror, but, but to, to, to add to this scene of, of this fear of height, these, these, this particular area, this scene, the junkyard, all of it called back to uh, times with Ray, both in The Force Awakens as well as in, um, as in the Death Stars uh, scene in The Rise of Skywalker, that I felt like they are having to cross through some really rough terrain. Um, there's some heights to be involved here. Mm. Uh, all of this really re- recall back to those other Star Wars movies as well, all rolled into this. And you're right, there's there's definitely a height situation here. But as there was with all of those others, with Ray jumping, with with Kylo Ren jumping in in those scenes, it, to me, it all just encompassed a lot of these different scenes that we've come to love, all encompass into one. Oh, I agree. Very, very well said. Very well said. So yeah. then we we go actually go into the docking, into the medical bay itself, tech informs us that it's not sanitary, which I thought was, was pretty hilarious. <laughs> uh, but then we get another great uh, moment of character. The the fear, there's another, one of the themes in, in Star Wars I feel like we haven't talked a lot about, especially on this show over the years, is is isolation and how powerful and frightening that is. Yeah. But, but Omega shares her concern that, you know, if something happens to Wrecker, I'm going to be left behind. Tom, what, what, <laughs> tell me, tell me about that. This was, this was, um, thank you for asking me the question. Cause I really wanted to talk about <laughs> this. I, this, this was a really touching moment. And, uh, and I, I say that to me, to, I say that as individually myself, as a parent, because I've heard, I've heard that that line almost exactly come from my own children. What if something goes wrong? And you really feel that isolation that you mentioned, Dan, where she feels so alone, even though they're all standing there, but it's the, it's the hypothetical. What ha- what if that scary, what if when you're a child and where, where it hit me personally is Hunter gives almost verbatim a line that I've given to my own children. He says, we aren't going anywhere. You're stuck with us. Even though 
as the adult, he knows the, the situation. He knows the uncertainty of removing. I mean, none of them there actually knows except Rex. And Rex has done nothing but tell them that it's, you know, I've never been on this side of it and it's difficult and it was hard for me and all of that. And so he, so Rex has done nothing to like say, oh, it's going to be okay. It's, you don't even know what's happening. It's none of that. And so Hunter says this to Omega, you know, as an adult would to a child, even if, you know, even, you know, in, in, you know, you're sitting in the basement during a tornado warning or a hurricane warning, and you're saying everything's going to be fine. When in the back of your head, you really don't know that's going to happen. And so you feel that isolation that Omega is fearing. It, it almost puts us back into the shoes of a child because we know how things could go. And, and we still haven't resolved that that Wrecker could possibly still turn, you know. And so there's there's some fear there. And I also think it makes... Uh, us worrying about record turning bad. I think for the most, for most of it, I've, I've mo- mostly felt bad and worry that Omega is going to feel bad, that she's going to be sad that she's lost her friend. Mm-hmm. But when it happens like that, her childish fears have suddenly become very adult and very real because that, that fear of being left alone is, is pretty frightening, but I don't know, Alan, to me, nothing's really quite as frightening as the actual, transformation it, there's a there's a lot of tropes here with some, a lot of different horror and suspense but go ahead and walk us through records transformation and, and please share things that you noticed about it so and and i'm gonna i'm gonna preface this i spent time earlier today re-watching uh season six where cup goes through some similar moments because i feel like this this situation with with record reminded me and was very much similar to that of Tufts. I think they both had similar experiences. And so for a moment, I thought, okay, this is not going to end well. In fact, I don't know, leading up to this, I wasn't sure that they were going to get the chip out. And I don't know if it's because I didn't expect it in this episode or, or whatever it was, but it, you, you felt like, okay, they're getting ready to do this, but it's something's going to happen. And of course it has to happen. And Omega has to be the one that he chases down. And, that's what, yeah, that's what I was afraid of would happen the most is that she ends up being the one that he nearly, nearly takes out. The one that he cares most about that she cares, you know, they've had this great relationship and here he is, he's about to, about to, to take her out because, you know, they've got to follow orders and, and I'll get, you know, Rex, Rex is the guy who has to save the day and, and ultimately does, but Wrecker it's hard to put into feelings where I was feeling with this because this scene moved so quickly and was so energy energizing, like just so quick. Um, just watching him, and I'm I'm bumbling for words here, guys. You guys are so much better with words than I than I am. But but this particular scene was was very revealing for for what Order sixty six was, and we've already seen plenty of that. But also the fact that they had to literally stun him in order to get in order to get that out of his head. Oh yeah, I agree. And to me, it's also what I, what I really notice about this, and, and you just helped me think of this out. So thank you. Is that we, as we know, what Order sixty six does, we've seen what it's done to the Jedi. Clearly, we've seen what it's done to the clones and, and their brothers. But the notion that it takes away the identity of people and what they're like, their their kindness, I, I think it's interesting. That first of all, we've let's just set it up once tech is trying to check on the inhibitor chip and he's using that sort of thing. And, and then the closer it gets to sensing the chip, the more the, the headache seems to be pulsing for Wrecker and really bothering him. Mm-hmm. And then once he turns bad, like he grabs that needle from him, you know, that's just like a classic thing from like an 80s slash where we were like, yeah. you're trying to sedate the, the monster or the enemy or the villain. And all of a sudden they grab the needle and it becomes a, th- uh, suddenly it's becomes a threat. And then the, the to me, the music was just that's like it. that that heavy synthesizer was was very powerful. Yeah, that's what that's what I was talking about in the opening that when he grabs the wrist there's that low bass and then there's like the music thrumming drums. I'm sorry, low bass music and then the thrumming drums almost like you're in um uh Wrecker's head in that like bum 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 like you're almost feeling the throbbing of the headache and the chip taking over oh my gosh what a horrifying moment it was it was very scary so well well put together 
and then you get to see all the fighting skills come into play with Hunter and, you know, being cool under pressure and, and getting everybody to work together, trying to distract Riker because he's such a tour de force that you know that he's physically, they're not going to, they don't stand a chance against him. And the fact that he's chasing after Omega, you expect that to happen because they've gone out of their way for, for a few episodes to show the, the bond the two of them have. Uh, but the, the fight scene to rest, restrain them and then record versus Omega Alan, I thought that was that was about as good as we've seen dramatically in the Bad Batch so far this season. I agree. I totally agree. And I'm glad you guys mentioned the music and, and mentioned some of the things you have because now I've got to go back and rewatch it. Um, you know, the way we've been talking about it tonight, I've been all over the place, which is really how I've watched this episode the last few days. Um, but music is where I usually first go. And this scene did tense up big time when he goes after Omega and, and, you know, right up to the point and, and she's hiding. I'm trying to think of other, you mentioned horror films, but I'm trying to think of another movie where it's, where it's someone that is so endearing to you and to the audience, but also to the character who's trying to hide mm-hmm. under, whether it be a desk in an office or behind a couch or whatever it's ha- it is. Halloween. I think the original Halloween. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's true. That's a good point. I hadn't even thought about that, but yeah, it, 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 that's what came to mind is here she is trying to hide. And of course there's a noise off over on the one side where she's hoping he'll go and he does, but then she, you're thinking that he's gone. And then right there, as if I predicted right there behind her, there he is. And, mm. and then just the way the whole, the way the whole thing became very, very tense. Um, it had me going for a minute. I'm not going to lie. It had me going for a minute. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I, there's, I think there's one thing, in the history, and I want to ask both of you this, and I'll weigh in on it too. There's one thing that that we've seen since we first learned of the inhibitor chips. Good soldiers follow orders. We've heard that line spoken through several episodes of Clone Wars, and now, of yep. course, through the Bad Batch. And I picked up something symbolic about that, and I wanted to see what you all thought. When, whenever you, when you hear good soldiers follow orders, what do you think is actually going on for the characters and story wise, Tom, I know it's a, a big question, but I, I have faith in you. Why don't we have you start? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> you want me to well, weigh in first or, well, or Alan? I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. So this is where, this is where I went is, I don't know that this answers the question, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, because yeah. I thought, I thought Wrecker took, took the the line even further he says good soldiers follow orders but then he he goes into like almost like reading the law he says you are in direct violation of order 66 Mm -hmm. and when when he's when he's got omega on or you know she's creeping away and, and she says she says but you're you're not you or something like that and then he repeats the directive again not the good soldiers follow orders but he repeats the you are in violation you are a traitor and he t- like it goes further and it's it's like you're realizing that he is completely gone so i i don't know that that answers the question of like what's this like symbolic about this or what's actually going on other than all i can think is the orders that they've been given are 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 bad like they're bad they're evil so it's like good soldiers follow orders but these soldiers are not good oh i like that alan and what 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 are you is there anything that whenever you hear the word whenever you hear the phrase good soldiers follow orders what are you noticing about how they use that line and what it means to me brainwashing comes to mind you know i know they use inhibitor chips here but to me it it it's as if they have been it 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 it's as if they've been brainwashed, whether it be from birth, whether it be, I mean, and really they have, I mean, inhibitor chip or not, they've been brainwashed to, or hypnotized. Hypnotism is another thing where it takes one word to, to set them off to do exactly what you wanted them to do. And hypnosis might be more, more clear than, than brainwashed because it's, it's a trigger word. That's all it is. It's a trigger word. And immediately they are now more robotic than man they are now more inhuman than human and they will do exactly what they're ordered to do um and that's what that's the way i've always watched it as since episode three with with order 66 even before we knew about the inhibitor chip so there was something set up in these clones very similar to that of hypnosis or brainwashing that sets them up that's what comes to mind i'm not sure if you were leading somewhere with that phrase in particular but that to me that's what comes to mind is that of brainwashing or hypnosis 
No, I love that. I, in, in fact, what you said makes me think it's almost like a sort of a harbinger of Vader too. You know, the more machine than man, and uh, yeah. and kind of yeah. losing your your will for what for whatever reason. There's just something that this time that when it when he when Wrecker said it, and I, the first time I watched it, I just thought, oh no, things are really going to get bad. But the second time I watched it, it I kind of hit me, and it gave me hope for Crosshair. It seems to me, and and I could be wrong. But whenever we hear good soldiers follow orders, the person saying that, this is the thing they most do not want to do. Oh. For Rex, it was when he was going to fight Ahsoka. Uh. With Crosshair, it's when he orders the, the murder of those innocents. And then for this, it's when Wrecker is about to attack Omega. It seems like that is the key line. Like That is their last psychological ditch effort at stopping this urge to do something evil. But because good soldiers follow orders, they don't have a choice. So this, whenever you hear that, this is the most extreme thing they would never want to do, and they're being forced to do it, which makes it much, much more tragic. Oh, yeah. And you can go back to Tup on that one because I remember it, you know, and, and now that you mention it, that makes Tup's situation even more yes. dramatic, yeah. even more tragic because of what Tup did in season six. I love it. Makes awesome. sense. Yeah, it just it just I just thought psychologically, wow, this is this is what where they're doing this is what they're going for, and it's it's really effective. Rex finally stuns Wrecker. And let's talk, Tom, about Wrecker's recovery, healing, and making peace. Yeah, this is such a amazing scene. They they pull so Wrecker comes out of the 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 tunnel. And, you know, it could take a while. Let's, why don't you take Omega up, upside, give her some air. And she says, I am not leaving his side. Um, you know, the loyalty, the, the camaraderie, as you mentioned several times, Dan, that, that they've been building over the last few episodes. Um, you know, we should have known that it was leading to this. And, you know, I think we probably in some ways knew that it was leading to this in some fashion. I just, I didn't see it playing out the way it did. Um, quite as <laughs> horrifying, although I, I think in my head, I was expecting it to be horrifying, just not in the way that, that we saw it. Um, but the, the, the scene that sits in my head, so this is, this is the snapshot. This is the snapshot moment of the episode for me. It's when they, they go to uh, Rex standing in the doorway and he's looking at his helmet and then he looks into the room and there is the Bad Batch holding like the silent vigil. They're all asleep, including Wrecker. And it's just, it's like Rex watching over this generation or this, you know, quote unquote, bad batch, the, the rejects, but the rejects are the ones that are surviving. But I love the way he like, he's holding his helmet and he looks at the face of his helmet. And for some reason, I have no idea what it means, but it's what popped into my head when he does that. I was like, it's like, he's examining his own identity. It's almost like he's reflecting on what it's meant to be a clone. And this is where it is led as he looks into um, the room where they're removing. And he, and he is who has led this new group into this new world of what I wrote down as freedom. You know, you look at each one of them as they come out of that and you see, you see the close up of Tech's head and he puts his head on the, on the bandage and they pull back and you see his face just in reflection of like this, this new freedom, this, like, even though Tech has been so dismissive, that moment told me that it has, okay, I'm mean, quite literally, it has been on his mind. And, uh, and, and now they're all feeling this sense of freedom and then Wrecker's hand comes up onto onto Omega's head so gently and and it's and it's Wrecker. It's the Wrecker we know and it's the Wrecker we love. And then in the next scene he comes up to her and he's, you know, and he apologizes. And she forgives him, of course. Of course she's going to forgive him. But the best part is she reaches into her pocket and pulls out the <laughs> hand of the Mantel mix. And Wrecker's like Oh, <laughs> like, like, of course he's going to think with his tummy, but it's so, oh my gosh, it was such a great, great moment. And it was, I don't know, so many things that were unexpected. I think probably the, the moment that moved me most I just described was when his hand so gently laid onto Omega's head and he said something to her. Oh, just, just the forgiveness that, that all came through all of it was just magnificent. The character stuff is great. And you, you're, you're 
your explanation of Rex reflecting into his helmet, I was going to talk about that. I'm not even going to touch that. You did such a beautiful job on that. I think you completely oh, thanks. nailed the, the importance and the symbolism of, of him reflecting on what it means to be himself, what it means to be a clone, mm-hmm. and what it means to be watching out for his brothers. Because, of course, Rex is going to feel that way. And yeah. with, without taking away from Tom, I want to add one thing to that scene, though. Please, yeah. You mentioned his helmet, and I'm thinking back while you're talking about it. And his helmet might be the most subtle reminder of all that Rex has been through. Yeah. With the, with the marks on it, you know, of, you know, one, two, three, you know, it's, it's just like all these marks on it that represent. Um, battle scars. And, yeah. Battle scars of everything that's gone on. And it just is, it's, it's in that moment he stares at it. It's, we see it throughout the episode. We see it towards the end. It, it, it's reminiscent of, of just what he's, you know, it's just a reminder, a subtle reminder of what he's had to go through back to what Tom said. And I think Tom, you said it better than anything I could say, but, but just, if you ever watch this episode again, I think you ought to just watch the, the, the helmet just yeah. from the get go. It's great because it's looking at him, you know, through the lens, through a dark lens, there's no expression. Right. And he's looking at it with the helmet off as, as, as a human, as a person with a soul, as a person with a conscience. And this has been, you know, Dave Filoni has said he believes that clones have souls and he's looking into the soulless helmet and reflecting on what's going on in his life. I mean, Rex has got a lot of soul searching to do before he ends up um, with a, a gray beard in Rebels, you know, 19 <laughs> plus years later. But I love the fact well, right, that and, and, Omega refuses, refuses to leave Wrecker's side. And, yeah. and, you know, they're like, you know, you need to go up to the service. You need to get some air. And she's like, no, I'm not leaving his side. And they don't even bother talk her out of it again the theme throughout this entire series has been we don't talk down to the child we respect this child's feelings we we retreat the child you know with dignity and grace but also let her make her own decisions it's just really really kind of refreshing and as is and you both mentioned this but i just want to briefly mention i think it's so important how these two make up because he says he's sorry but she isn't, but he doesn't say he's sorry. And they don't, there's never like a, a hug, forgiveness, shake hands. It's good. We're cool. There's none of that. It's here's some Mantelmix. The mission is over. This was just a mission for me, Wrecker. I don't take it personally. I know you would never want to hurt me. I know it's not your fault. And she believes that to her core. And then they break bread together in the form of Mantelmix. I mean, you know, Thanksgiving, that it's, it's such a powerful holiday for Americans uh-huh. because. Everyone comes together and they eat and they, and at that moment, it's just about being with the people you love. They love each other. They're, they're the closest they can be. And after all this trauma and these things that could potentially ruin friendships and cause all kinds of psychological damage from mega, Hey, it's no big deal. Let's eat this popcorn together. The mission is over. I just find that such a mature, mature lesson in, in forgiveness and maturity. And I, I don't think it's just maturity either with her. It, it reminds me it, it, if really it's, it's the representative of what she is to the clone. She is their purity. She is their beginning. She is, she yeah. is the, the clone that was never affected by the wars, that was never affected by the chip, that was never affected by, uh, by anything else, was the purest and innocent of all. Wow, and that's we well, saw that yes. come to climax into this, into this particular episode, and it ends right there where, it's not like who cares? It's over and done with. Let's have let's have some mix and let's you know let's celebrate the end of a mission. Like she doesn't know better and hasn't ever known better. Wow, that here, is here. that is really really profound. I love that. That's great. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot to love here. I mean, not only was it a powerful episode, but it ends with a cliffhanger. You know, let's notify the Empire, the Scrappers. See Hunter and Rex, who who just who basically does he, Rex tries to say, you know, we could really people could really use your skill set. And Hunter says, I'm still trying to kind of figure out what our next move is. Um, it seems pretty clear to us, but it's easier, you know, it's 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 hard to look at the picture when you're inside the frame. So, I, yeah, I, go I ahead. really, I'm I'm sorry, I really really liked that uh, discussion between the two of them at the end, too. Too. Um, because. You have Rex kind of watching over the. Oh, uh, sorry, I was <laughs> I was reading my notes from from inside the the ship. This is where um, 
right. You know, you catch Rex saying he'll meet at the, at the next, at the rendezvous in the next rotation. So, you know, again, he's in contact with, with people and, and Hunter comes out and makes, you know, makes comment, you know, you just, I knew you'd still have, you know, um, uh, 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 cards in the game there. And, uh, and I felt like this was like the second, the second chance, or not the second chance, the second calling of the bad batch to take action. But what I love about it is Hunter, <laughs> I look at it as Hunter has the same feeling about their purpose as I had about their purpose two or three episodes ago. Yeah, Hunt, Hunt, it's as unclear to Hunter as it was to me as to what they should be doing, but they continue to find purpose in these little moments, and they're 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 you know the ISIS chipping the the Martez sisters initially crack the ice and say, look, you've got there's there's something. Eventually, everybody takes a side. Uh, um, Rafa says to him, you know, which. Excuse me, which I thought was a great line, and then here you have Rex. Hey, I still I still have cards in the game, and you know you've got something that can help us. There's your second one. So I look forward to seeing who's going to push Hunter over the edge to make a decision to choose a side. The, the surprising thing to me about Hunter is that he now I think he's he's more hesitant to commit because everything yeah. that he's been raised to know or that he's been trained and shaped to know is different is wrong. So he's kind of trying to find his place. Very interesting, intriguing aspect of him because ultimately he doesn't strike me as someone who would be afraid to to do what he thinks is best. So the fact that he's struggling, it gives us a very unique inner conflict sort of, he's very, very much going on an extended refusal of the calls. We'll we'll see where that fleshes out. Do you think Uh, it's because of his care for Omega? I do. Do you think that's what's clouding? Yeah. I think that's a. I think that's the uh, the number one thing that's driving that personally. So, so guys, um, any last minute things you want to say before we wrap up this conversation about battle scars? Alan, let's start with you. Mm, just a couple thoughts. One is that I now want to change from a B to an A plus with you guys because I feel like the loner <laughs> here and maybe the guy that shouldn't have said anything. And <laughs> no, you shouldn't. Hey, that's but, great. But but second of all. Um, you know, to your last point, you said, I, I feel like the coming episodes and or season might involve them chasing after crosshair now versus crosshair hunting them because now they know what needs to be done and what they can do to bring their comrade back. And so oh. I almost wonder if that's their next move. If now they go after crosshair and try and snare him and bring him back to the junkyard and remove the chip from him as well. I almost feel I like that's got to be the Interesting. Next yeah. That's yeah. Fascinating. That's fascinating. I like it. And, you and Alan, because you mentioned oh. Omega is, is you mentioned Omega's clouding him. I kind of wonder if, if, if Hunter's uh, care for Crosshair still exists. And so there's still that, that torn conflict there that he knows what Crosshair is now dealing with and wants very much to get him out of the mix. I hope, I hope so. I mean, yeah. we, we do know we get, we've got a nice cliffhanger ending that the empire is being notified. So it's very possible we'll see crosshair sooner rather than later. Tom, any last minute things on this episode? Just a couple. First, Alan, you're not you're not the first person to change their grade. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> these these conversations change my mind all the time because it, and that's what I love about these conversations is we get to, you know, it, we get to really dig in and and hear what other people think. And Dan, you always give me and challenge me in different ways to think about these. And Alan, you the same. So uh, so yeah, that you're not the first. Second is, I was just going to repeat that final line, notify the empire. I'm tuning in next Friday. <laughs> yeah, I think I will too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it was a great episode. The, again, the suspense, the tension, the drama, the character stuff. Every time I really like an episode of the bad batch, it's because of those things. And they, they continue to deliver in, in big ways. Let's take one more break and close out the show. This is coffee with Kenobi. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> As we near the end of the show today, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live 
at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi and have a cup of coffee, tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. We have a lot of fun and you'll make some new friends as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, go to www.cwkalliance.com and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pour Over, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos, and so much more. If you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air, feel free to email me at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com and I'll share them on the show. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zair, M-R-Z-E-H-R, or on Instagram at danzaircwk. There are also a lot more ways to connect with me and Coffee with Kenobi on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi. Check us out on Pinterest or subscribe to our Coffee with Kenobi YouTube channel. On our YouTube channel, you can find Facebook Live video, different interviews throughout the years, highlights of video coverage throughout the Coffee with Kenobi history, and the audio podcast itself. You can order my book, The Star Wars Book, which I co-wrote with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Books A Million, Walmart, or anywhere books are sold. You can also find my writing on Coffee with Kenobi's website, as well as StarWars.com, where I am an official blogger there, and on IGN, where I contribute occasionally to articles about Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. If you are considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out DanzyMedia.com, and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. I want to inspire you to be inspired so you can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks, as always, to our Coffee with Kenobi sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet you want to go on your vacation. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash Mouse Fan Travel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word, and I can't thank you enough for your help for your support and your friendship. I love so much being a part of this wonderful Star Wars community, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do for me and Coffee with Kenobi. You, of course, delivered in a huge way. It was wonderful to finally have you on Coffee with Kenobi. Please let everybody know where they can find Idiots Array. Tell us all about the show and let everybody know where they can reach out to you on social media. So you can find us on Twitter, Idiots Array. Um, you can email us. And, and I check email and Twitter through the Twitter account, through the email account it here at the idiots they at uh, Gmail. I don't use Twitter hardly at all anymore. I'm gone. But people can always hook me up on Facebook. Just look up Jedi Zara because that's how I've been known for the last decade. Um, so people can find me there. And by the way, if there's hope for me to change my grade, then Tom, I know you will love that I say this, but there is most certainly hope that Dan can join the Falcon is Living group. 
<laughs> I know it. I know it can happen. <laughs> I will never disparage someone for having hope. It's what it what brings us together. But that ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen. No, I wasn't going to let that go. I had to. I had to go there. I love it. I was wondering if it was going to come up. Been right waiting yet. for the moment. Yes. You, you, that was a very that was very pinpoint accurate, my friend. And Tom, please let everybody know about uh, what you've got going on and where they can reach out to you. Absolutely. You can find me on Twitter at DraftLine and uh, check out my thoughts on the uh, on, on the galaxy. Seeking Positivity in the Galaxy is the title of my blog. Hop on there, see my thoughts, follow up, give me some feedback. Uh, love to hear from you. A huge thank you to Alan and Tom for joining me to talk about this incredible episode that really raises the emotional stakes and brings some resolution, but also opened up the idea of more challenges specifically, of course, with crosshairs. I want to take this opportunity to let everybody know about an exciting thing that I announced on Facebook Live this week. On Wednesday, June 30th, if you're in the Orlando area, I'm having a coffee with Kenobi Meetup at Disney Springs and Jock Lindsay's Hangar Bar from 7 o'clock to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is Wednesday, June 30th from 7 o'clock to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can go and learn more at coffeewithkenobi.com slash community RSVP. And I hope to see all of you there. If you're in the area, it's going to be great fun. Speaking of Facebook Live, of course, it's every Monday night. But on June 29th, which is a Tuesday, it's a special day and time. I will be giving you a tour of Galaxy's Edge. I will be in the Orlando area, obviously, because of the meetup I just mentioned. So you can tour Galaxy's Edge with me live, experience the sights and sounds of that, too. And I'll be showing you around the place. If you've never been to Galaxy's Edge or you have and you just want a nice reminder of how incredible this place is, join me Tuesday, June 29th at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time at coffeewithkenobi.com slash live. I hope to see all of you there. Have a great week and weekend. Get your top fives ready for next week's Coffee with Kenobi Facebook Live. And remember, this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here.